Hello and welcome. All right, I can hear myself on my end at least. Wait for the wife to give the, uh, hey, look at that, I got it good to go. Uh, we have a pretty funny system actually. She's got a laser pointer in the back and she points at little post-it notes on the wall in front of me. Uh, so it's pretty amusing. Maybe I'll post a picture of this setup at some point. Uh, anyway, so for anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. And this week we're exploring uh, Channel Islands National Park. We'll also vote near the end of the next national park we want to go explore together. So look out for that and other posts coming in the chat as we're flying around. Also feel free to post questions or thoughts, whatever comes to your mind. Uh, in past weeks, I had sort of pre-planned questions that I would ask and just kind of stir up conversation as we go. Um, it's probably good for engagement, but it, it's a little bit clunky. So this week, instead, I'm generally just going to uh, talk about things as we go along. And if you have funny stories or ideas or whatever, feel free to just throw them out there. Um, you know, whatever whatever the topic is, or if it's even preferentially pref <laughs> peripherally related, real, uh, related, it's just fine. Uh, and fractals, of course, if you have various family members who happen to work in or around a particular topic, you got to also mention that. And small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator today. So please don't try this in real life. I've also researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation uh, and worked to improve their Wikipedia pages. Using Wikipedia makes sure the facts here are checked by others and gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. To that end, if you notice anything missing or that should be clarified, please help improve the wiki pages. As the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Channel Islands National Park. And Fractals has already posted up a number of these uh, links. Thank you very much, Fractals. Yeah, the floating head. <laughs> All right, look at that. So hello, everyone. So I'll get myself going on a takeoff poll here. And Fractals posted up that first poll. So have you ever been to this national park before? Yes, in the last 10 years. Yes, once upon a time, or not yet. Well, we're taking off here from the coast of, let me make sure I'm gonna take off well, Southern California, just a little north of LA. There's actually a harbor that a lot of the uh, ships would leave from and boats would leave from Channel Islands Harbor uh, just off to our left here so just a, a quick overview of what we're gonna do today so there's five islands as part of the Channel Islands we're gonna hit four of them as part of the live stream itself and then Santa Barbara is kind of down in the edge here and then the last island Catalina Island is not one of the Channel Islands National Park uh, Channel Islands um, but it's a really beautiful place to land. It's a, an airport a lot of pilots enjoy going to visit. It's a bucket list item for me. And so for time, we're going to be able to do about these four islands. And then after the uh, live stream, I'll do a little kind of zip around and just go and see them for anyone who wants to hang around and see what they look like. For those of you who are in the Microsoft Flight Simulator simulation, I highly recommend flying to uh, Catalina at some point, uh, either with this flight plan or just in general. That's a pretty fun place to go visit. Uh, just a quick thought on the plane. So today we're in a flight design CTSL, this little uh, high wing plane here. Uh, there's a couple of folks who are flying uh, Pipistrels or a couple other planes as well. So you maybe see those floating around. Uh, not a great plane for an actual ocean flight, but pretty fun in the simulator. So we'll, uh, we'll use it because we can. Stop my climb here just a little bit. I do not have autopilot on this one, so I'm going to be doing some more hand trimming, which is good practice. For those of you who want to sync up times on these, I'm at about noon, so that seems to be a pretty good time of day for lighting on the islands um, and then clear skies for the weather. A uh, small administrative update before we dive in. So I one just a fun... Uh, I guess, bit of my life. So I did a mountain checkout this weekend, which means that I am now allowed by my uh, flying club to go and fly in mountains over 8,000 feet. Uh, so it was a pretty eventful weekend for me. Uh, a little bit more heavy duty plane. I took out a Piper Dakota this weekend. Uh, as for the flight stream itself, the uh, the live stream itself, excuse me, the there's four community content creators that I wanted to give a shout out to today for their work. This is all posted to flightsim.to. 
You may recognize some of it in here if you've seen what the islands look like before and after. Um, but, oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Fractals, I can go, uh, I can go take a look at that real quick and see. Never mind, Jules fixed it. Hey, there you go. Thank you. Okay, cool. So four different community content creators that I wanted to call out. I will try and use uh, good enhancements when I can go and find them. So uh, first, Wookiee42 created an enhancement for all of the Channel Islands National Park. And he leveraged the work of uh, Mykia.at and BadMed's uh, work to do that. Also, sorry if I'm getting these name pronunciation wrongs. They're all screen names. And then uh, Ho Hosu Mahij uh, created scenery for the beautiful Catalina Airport. So if you are going to go and fly to Catalina Island, I highly recommend installing his uh, add-on as well. So that's all linked from the flight plan for those of you who would like to add it. All right, and it sounds like 100% of the poll then was have not yet visited Channel Island. So hopefully by the end of the stream, you're, you're as excited as I am about the park. So the park purpose statement, typically I just read this, but I'm actually more of a, a visual kinesthetic learner. And so it was always a little painful for me um, kind of pulling these up and then not, not having a way for those of us who are less uh, auditory learners to, to internalize it. So I'll read the park purpose statement, but I also uh, actually grabbed a picture of it from the foundation document. So hopefully this helps for uh, those of you like that. The purpose of Catalina Islands National Park is to protect and connect the public to a nationally significant natural, scenic, wildlife, marine, ecological, historical, archaeological, cultural, and scientific values of the Channel Islands in the state of California. This is a little bit more general, but there's a lot of a lot of blending and interesting things that happen in this park. A lot of um, a lot of aspects of what make a great national park coming together all at once. The park itself also posts, if you've been to a national park, they sometimes have a theater and they'll play a long video about the national park. So this park posts the entire video online, which I think is wonderful. We don't have time to watch the whole thing. It's about 24 minutes long, but it does give a really good overview of the park. And so I'm going to pull up and we'll watch the first about five and a half minutes, and then I'll skip to the end. We'll watch the closing section on it as well. Um, and then afterwards, I'll post that link to Discord. If you'd like to see the whole video, it's very good. It goes into a bit more depth, um, but but we'll, uh, we'll do the overview part. So let me... Hopefully my plane is trimmed up enough I can set that controller down. All right. distant world shimmers. Five islands and the seas around them. A wilderness protected by wind and waves. It is a place of solitude and adventure. California used to be. Out past the edge of the continent, out on the edge of the imagination, this lost world beckons. That arch is actually right off our left wing right now, so it would show up there if it was a little more clear. Off 
the coast of Southern California lie a group of islands cloaked in mist. Channel Islands National Park. It's just a short boat ride from one of the most populated regions on Earth. But few travel here, out where the mainland ends. Those who do find a remarkable refuge. Half land, half water. Isolated, but overflowing with life. Five islands and the sea that guards them. And a kappa jutting out of the sea. Craggy and volcanic with its iconic arch rock. The historic lighthouse. And wildflowers that bring the rocky soil to life. Santa Cruz, the largest and most diverse of them all. A rough mountainous island cut by a massive fault line. Home to nearly 60 plants and animals found nowhere else on Earth. And for the many visitors who come from the mainland, it is an island playground. Santa Rosa. A landscape that rolls from the mountains to the marshes, sheltering rare Torrey pines, weathered sandstone canyons, and vestiges of a ranching past. San Miguel, an island of extremes, wild, windy, and remote where isolated beaches protect one of the largest rookeries of seals and sea lions in the world. And ancient dunes reveal the Caliche Forest, fossilized trees from long ago. Santa Barbara, the tiny tableland. Mesa framed by twin peaks and steep rock faces, where stunning wildflowers and nesting seabirds draw the occasional visitor from the distant mainland. And all around, an underwater national park, a mile of sea on the fringes of the land, one of the planet's great marine ecosystems, glowing with life. There's the first part of the video, nice little overview. And we'll talk more about the shoe mesh uh, towards the end of the stream. Oops, bring this forward. So today, the Channel Islands beckon us. 175 miles of untouched coastline. The opportunity to see a vibrant world teeming with life. To make sure it stays that way is a mission that continues. To hold this land in trust for the generations to follow. This is the calling of Channel Islands National Park. For all, a place to study and cherish, a place to experience and enjoy, a place to conserve. Out past the edge of the continent, it waits, guarded by the wind and the waves, this island world, a wilderness, shimmering on the horizon.
And yes, they do do airplane tours. If you are now interested in going to see the islands, uh, that is an option for you. So I hope that was kind of a, a fun overview. I really liked that video. And like I said, I'll post the whole 24 minute long one afterwards. That's definitely worth checking out. Let me flip back here. So we're right over uh, San, uh, Santa Cruz Island, excuse me. Let me pull up a couple of quick photos. You saw them in that in that uh, video, but just so we have some of these ones here. So here's the uh, lighthouse. It's right at the edge of the uh, Anacapa Island, and then that uh, arch that I mentioned. There's the lighthouse a little bit closer up from a different angle. And the arch rock, which you also got to see in the video. Inspiration point then is right at the end of the island, and so this is looking backwards. And I have one of Santa Cruz, but I'll pull that up more on the other side of the island, so it'll make more sense. Uh, Jurassic Park vibes. Yeah, West Wing and Jurassic Park. It's like if the two of them got together and did a collaboration, which, thinking about it, actually seems like a great idea. I think we should, we should try and make that happen. Okay, so Santa Cruz Island is pretty cool. There's a central valley that goes through, and we're going to fly right down in there. For those of you flying along who are feeling a little more daring, there is a fun little runway along the way. I won't be landing along this time because I think that's a little bit more more excitement than I want to deal with uh, in the middle of a stream. But uh, for those of you who would like to, it's pretty fun. It's a nice little uh, grass runway. So that's a little bit about the park. Uh, our person of the week we're going to talk about at the end. So why don't we dive into our first topic for the day? Fractals, do you mind posting up the poll? And our first topic is California sea lions. Which you probably saw a couple of times in that in that video just a moment ago. Let me pop out of the plane here. We can see the island a little bit bigger. Actually, some cool buildings in and around Santa Cruz. They hinted at the uh, history of... Hello, everyone. Um, they hinted at the history of the park as sort of having a ranching background. There's a lot more to that story. Uh, we won't talk about it much more today, but if you're interested, it's sort of an area of California that, that wasn't really developed like the rest of California and became a big uh, ranch area. Neat story. So our first topic uh, is California sea lions. And the question in the poll is, what does a distinct crest bone on an animal's head tell you? And sea lions have this kind of, male sea lions have this distinct crest bone. You also see it on male gorillas. So if you think like that kind of whole thing, that piece that sticks out, what does it mean? So is it, it likely has strong chewing muscles. It likely headbutts other animals. Or it likely can steal your girl. Hopefully your girl's not competing with you. For a, with a sea lion, but, you know, whatever. All right, we're flying through our Central Valley here. So while people are voting on that, the connection to the park, California sea lions are probably the most familiar marine mammal in the Channel Islands. These smart, playful animals are often seen feeding, playing in the surf, or lounging on the beaches of San Miguel, Anacapa, and Santa Barbara. San Miguel Island is home to one of the largest rookeries in the world for California sea lions, with a breeding population of approximately 80,000 animals. So what are they and what do they look like? You saw a little bit of it in the video. Let me pull this up real quick. So I have a lot of pictures of sea lions I will show. So this is just a drawing of them because it kind of captures some of the essence. But that's a that's a sea lion. And the California sea lion is a coastal eared native uh, seal, an eared seal native to Western North America. It's one of six species of sea lion within the family of the eared seals. It's grouped with other sea lions and fur seals, collectively known as eared seals, these differ from true seals. So this is a true seal. So you'll notice that a true seal does not have ears. And so it's just little holes in the side of its head. Whereas a eared seal, or uh, excuse me, an, an, yes, an eared seal, like this is another picture of a sea lion, they have little ear flaps over them. So look in the pictures of the sea lions, you'll always see these little ear flaps. They're kind of cute, I think. They also uh, typically will have proportionally larger fore flippers and pectoral muscles on the eared sea lions. Oh, I, I didn't point this out, but this is kind of funny. Uh, it's a funny quote, so I'll just pull this back up and I'll show another picture in a moment anyway. So the, uh, why don't I do this. So it looks like we have most of our votes today are it likely has strong chewing muscles, which is the correct answer. So good guesses on those ones. 
Uh, fractals, yes, it probably could steal your girl. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay, so the uh, the quote on the bottom here is, don't, st- don't tell fish stories where the people know you, but particularly, don't tell them when they know the fish. So that's a quote from Mark Twain, and a fish story is a story that exaggerates the truth. So it's the way that a, a fish gets bigger every time the fisherman tells a story about catching it. That's kind of a funny quote. <laughs> Shots fired, yeah. Uh, okay, so California sea lions are uh, sexually dimorphic, meaning the males are larger than the females and have a thicker neck and protruding ridge of bone running lengthwise along the middle top of their skull. So that's that crest bone that I mentioned. So this is what it looks like on a different animal, but it's a pretty distinct picture of, of the skull. So there's that crest bone. And it, it does indicate a stronger chewing muscle. So here's a male sea lion, just to kind of see that. And you can see the crest bone a little bit in this picture. I'll zoom in just a moment here. Oops. Unlucky with my zoom. There we go. A little bit of that crest. Whereas if you look at the female, it has no crest bone. The males are typically about 9 feet long and 100 and 770 pounds heavy, while females are typically about 7 feet and weigh up to 220 pounds, so much lighter. As far as habitat, the natural range is from southeast Alaska to central Mexico, including the Gulf of California. This is the typical range for a a California sea lion. In the wild, they can live up to 17 years, although in captivity, uh, one California sea lion lived for 31 years. So what do they do during the day? If you're a sea lion, what does your kind of daytime look like? Well, mainly they'll haul out on the sand or rocky beaches, and they'll also frequent man-made environments such as marines and wharfs. So this would be California sea lion just hanging out on a rock. And then if you go to Pier 39 in California, you might see something like this, which is all the sea lions hanging out on the wharf. Kind of a fun place to go. And we'll play a little video of them barking later, and you can see it's kind of a fun place to be. (laughs) And the new lot is Chase. Nice. You've obviously seen sea lions before. So I did not learn any more about that. The sea lions, if you go and see them, they... If you ever see them, you can kind of watch them. They're very social, and they do a lot of body... They, they use their voice to communicate, but they also use their body to communicate. I would assume that has something to do with communicating. Um, but I didn't. that didn't come up in particular. But it looks. It very much looks like they're lifting up their arms to kind of air out their armpits. Uh, and since they're all so close together, you can see it's kind of funny. It's like they're airing out their armpits at their friends right there. So. Good question, though. All right, so that's the airport that I mentioned. Uh, we'll be flying over. If folks want to give it a go. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll keep flying because we got a little bit of a little bit ahead of us. But uh, when we get to the last island here, I'll just turn around. And so anyone, if you are looking to catch up, you can um, you can just join up again there. It should be pretty easy. Make sure I'm following my flight path here. Uh, the other thing about California sea lions is they will stay at sea for as long as two weeks at a time um, and when they're out there they'll make uh, a bunch of continuous dives and then they'll just come to the surface to rest so when they're not uh, hauling out when they're not out at shore typically during uh, breeding season then they might stay out for as long as two weeks they travel alone or in groups while at sea and then they'll do a haul out uh, between each sea trip and that's where something like a san miguel island is so important they feed on a number of species of fish and squid, and they are preyed on by killer whales and great white sharks. As a quick fun fact about uh, sea lions, the stomach of an average California sea lion may contain as many as 100 uh, gravel-sized rocks. No one is really sure why they're, uh, what they're used for, but they're believed to ease hunger pains during their mating and fasting periods. We'll talk about this when we talk about how they do uh, the breeding season, but they have to sort of stay in their territory to, to continue claiming it, which means that the males end up fasting for a very long time, and so eating rocks to stay uh, stave off hunger kind of makes sense. As far as communication, so Nublado Trace, good question on, on that one. They will do numerous vocalizations, and notably this is a bark or a mother-pup contact call. So here's a quick video of them chasing a boat. I will play this. I think I can probably do it like this. Oops. I want to make sure I get my attribution in since this is a good Sorry, not playing it. 
I'm not uh, showing it. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, I wish I had this a little bit more. So let me do this. What I'm going to do is pull up this video. So there's the attribution on it, and I'll just play it right in here. bit of them barking so it does sound a little bit like a dog and if you end up going to a wharf where you see them or some other place you'll hear a lot of that barking sound it's kind of fun uh, fractals good question i feel like that's a research project waiting to happen um this is sort of my my deduction about the males is me deducing uh so so not uh not necessarily what's going on but uh but it seems like a a cool project actually to run and there's good research centers on the Channel Islands, so if you're looking for an excuse to to get out to the islands of California, so-called Galapagos Islands of California, which is sort of deserved, actually. They have a lot of species that are only native there. All right, so how do they reproduce? From May to August, males establish territories and try to affect, attract females with which to mate. Females are free to move between territories and are not coerced by males. It's an important last fact there. This is something that would be directly contrast to how the Roosevelt Elks, when we went to Olympic National Park, talked about how the Roosevelt Elks will go and actually um, kind of harass females back into their harem. In the case of uh, sea lions, males will establish a territory, but females can move between as they'd like. And they also don't have to necessarily mate with a male who has a territory, although typically that's how it's done. Mothers then, after they have their pups, they'll nurse their pups between foraging trips. And then outside of breeding season, California sea lions spend most of their time at sea, uh, although they do come to shore to molt uh, once a year. So I think it's once a year, actually. I should check that. I'll point out another quick airstrip here. So folks, if you, if, for folks who have s installed that community add-ons that I mentioned at the beginning, that actually adds a couple of airstrips that are not in the game. So this one is not in the base Microsoft Flight Simulator, but it seems like a very fun airport to go uh, fly to if you're looking for uh, another one. This gets you out to Santa Rosa Island. All right, so California sea lions have a couple of adaptations in particular. So one of them is that they rely heavily on their uh, fore flippers to propel themselves while swimming. This form of aquatic locomotion, along with the streamlined body, effectively reduces drag in the water. So it's the way that they keep themselves up to speed. They also have a very flexible spine, and it allows them to bend their neck back, back far backwards enough that they can reach their hind flippers, and so they can do dorsal turns and maintain a streamlined posture. So they have an incredible flexibility. Next time you see a video of a, a sea lion, or you go see one in real life, you'll see them do these sort of like incredible backflips looking. It's because they have a very flexible spine. When moving on land, the California sea lion is able to turn its hind flippers forward and actually walk on all fours which means it's actually able to move pretty quick on land. I'll talk about that uh, towards the end here. Underwater, they can travel around... Uh, I have seven miles per hour written here, although I seem to remember it being actually quite a bit more than that by another article, so I'm going to put a little fact check bubble on that one. Um, but they can dive, this one at least I saw in a couple of places, they can dive to a depth of about 900 feet for up to 10 minutes, although typically they're at dives of about 250 feet for less than three minutes. So, some rough numbers. Uh, hey, thanks for following, Chancellor. Also, I saw a Boeing 747 follow earlier, so hello, both. Uh, Boeing 747, if you haven't seen the video of them doing a barrel roll in a 747, uh, the guy who did it was not supposed to do it, but it's a very fun video to watch. It happened over uh, in Seattle when they were demoing the plane. Um, so that's a fun one for, since your username is 747. All right, back to sea lines. 
So relationship, they have a, a, a interesting relationship with humans. California sea lions are particularly intelligent and can be trained to perform various tasks and display limited fear of humans if accustomed to them. Because of this, California sea lions are a popular choice for public display in zoos, circuses, and aquariums, and are trained by the U.S. Navy for certain military operations. California sea lions have demonstrated an ability to understand simple syntax and commands when taught in artificial sign language. And so here's one of a working uh, California sea lion. So it's got its little harness on and it's a, a working pup. I'll pull up this one real quick. So this is a sea lion show, which if you've gone to see uh, an aqu aquatic show, you may have seen something like this before. Hang off to the side so you can see that. All right. Quick attribution on here. Pretty cool. It's a impressive animal in a lot of ways. Twenty five. Thank you, fractals. Twenty five miles per hour. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, that that was that was the number that I was remembering too, because I have um, part of my my joke later has to do with the speeds that they swim at. Uh, so that's why it was standing out to me as weird. Thank you. A Smithsonian says thirty five, but twenty five to thirty. Great. Thank you. All right, so in summary, the California sea lion is a coastal eared seal native to Western North America. It is one of six species of sea lion within the family of eared seals. They are gregarious animals and hang out in large groups when they haul out. California sea lions communicate with numerous vocalizations, notably barks and mother-pup contact calls. They are particularly intelligent and can be trained to perform various tasks. And one thing that I, when we were talking about speeds all this time, I had forgot to mention sea lions can actually run and or, excuse, swim and run faster than humans. Uh, so swimming may not be as so much of a surprise, but running is pretty cool. So they can run uh, faster over short distances. And I guess it depends on your running speed. I wish I jotted on the number. I feel like it was something like 12 miles per hour or so, uh, but it's pretty fast for a, for a short sprint. Uh, so, but, but still good to know. And so in practice, knowing that they can swim very fast and can run very fast, that just means that when you're competing against one in a triathlon, you really need to make up that time on cycling. All right. <laughs> we'll leave that one there. Fractals, do you want to pull up the second topic? Now we're leaving Santa Rosa Island just off our left here. And that's, uh... Up to, coming up to San Miguel, Miguel, excuse me, which is actually where the sea lions will will uh, haul out if they're going to go hang out there. Well, Fractals gets that pull up, perfect. Here's a picture of the Santa Rosa Cliffs. So that island we just left, that's what the cliffs of that island look like. And then the Torrey Pines on Santa Rosa. So that was mentioned in the video too, but that's another view. And you can see, I believe that is Santa Cruz Island in the distance. And then we're coming up right now to San Miguel Island. So this is what this looks like. And we're actually going to fly over that cove. Uh, it's called uh, Color Har Harbor. I sure looked up how to pronounce that, but it's right off the edge there. So that's what that looks like in real life. All right, so our second topic today is pelicans. And the poll question is, a what is a pelican's throat pouch used for? So is it storing food or water? Is it hiding Pokemon cards? Or fishing, using it sort of like a fishnet? <laughs> Sailor, guy. Sailor guy says cute. Yeah. Was that on the, the pole or the, uh, the cheesy bicycling joke? Or maybe both, you know. We were talking in the Discord before this uh, just about my particular sense of humor. It's very laugh at myself sort of style. I think it's probably a good thing. All right, well, folks, vote on that one. The connection to the park is the only breeding colonies of California brown pelicans in the western United States are within the Channel Islands National Park on West Anacapa Island. Uh, West Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands, excuse me. Although brown pelicans are particularly interesting, uh, we'll talk about pelicans in general today. And I'll highlight some of the key differences when brown pelicans come up. 
Uh, but if you want to learn more about them, they are they kind of got their own story going on. Another airstrip coming up here, this Ranger Station airstrip, is a pretty cool one as well. Again, from the flight sim community that was added in afterwards. So uh, go and check that out if you're interested. A couple of fun landings here. All right, so it looks like we have... A <laughs> so the the last option on there, fishing using a sort of like a fish net, it's a correct option. Uh, so nice job on there. We got two for hiding Pokemon cards, uh, which is which is a pretty good a pretty good second guess. It would be incredible if you encountered a, a pelican that was just uh, you know out dealing cards somewhere. Oh, lowercase. Okay, got it. Just missed it. Okay. Thanks, Fractals. Uh, sorry, Mad Wisman Girl. So the first answer on it uh, is a common misconception, and it comes from sort of some old stories about pelicans, uh, but it's not true. So pelicans don't store food and water in their in their bills, in their pouch. They they just use it for hunting, kind of like a net. All right, so let's start at the top. What are pelicans? So pelicans are uh, are large, very large water birds. They're characterized by a long beak and a large throat pouch used for catching prey and draining water from the scooped up contents before swallowing. So there's that poll question. They have predominantly pale plumage, except for the brown and Peruvian pelicans. The bills, pouches, and bare facial skin of all pelicans become brightly colored during the breeding season. Excuse me, before the breeding season. I'll pull up a quick picture. So here's a, a white pelican. There we go. And here's a picture of a California brown pelican. I'll throw a lot of different pictures of different pelicans, uh, so you'll get this, the general uh, gist of them, but there's quite a few that exist. Uh, actually, there are eight living pelican species, which are traditionally divided into two groups, one containing the four ground nesters, which are mainly white adult plumage, and four containing gray or brown plumage species, which nest primarily in trees or on sea rocks. So four that nest on land, four that nest in trees or sea rocks. Uh, that way of breaking them down between the ones that nest on sea and the ones that nest on or sea rocks, trees versus land uh, is nice in theory, but in practice, DNA analysis shows that it's a lot more nuanced. Uh, there's a bunch of the white, some of the white species come from the old world and some have evolved in the new world. In short, the pelicans evolved in the old world and then spread into the Americas and the preference for tree or ground nesting is more related to size than it is to genetics. So. so what do they look like? Pelicans are very large birds with uh, very long bills characterized by a down-curving hook at the end of the upper mandible and an attachment of a huge uh, pouch on the lower side of the bill. So let me pull up a picture here. A couple of things to notice here. One, besides that expression and the eyes, which are spooky in my opinion, um, the end of his bill actually has this hook there, and then there's the obvious pouch is a pretty big part of it. So you'll notice in some of these other pictures I pull up of pelicans that that hook is an important thing that they use. Uh, the slender uh, rami of the lower bill and the flexible tongue muscles form a pouch into a form the pouch into a basket for catching fish and sometimes rainwater, although not to hinder the swallowing of. Uh, not to hinder the swallowing of larger fish, their tongue is very tiny. So they have this large kind of um, pouch structure, large bill structure, but their tongue itself is, is very small. They have a long neck and short stout legs with large fully webbed feet. Although they are among the heaviest flying birds, they are relatively light for their apparent bulk because of the air pockets in their skeleton and beneath the skin. Those air pockets allow them to float higher on water too. So when you're seeing these pictures, think of them, first of all, notice the, the hook at the end of the beak, but then also look at how high they sit in the water versus like a duck, which sits a little bit lower. And that's because they have these air pockets under their skin. They have a long neck and large stout legs with large fully webbed feet. Uh, oh, sorry, I already said that. Uh, the tail is short and square, square and the wings are long and broad and suitably shaped for soaring and gliding flight. The smallest species is the brown pelican. So that's the, the one that's kind of important for this park. And it's a, it has a wingspan of as little as six feet, right? So it's the wingspan of a person. That's the smallest pelican. The largest is believed to be the Dalmatian, and it has a length of six feet, but a wingspan of 9.8 feet. 
The Australian pelican's bill may grow up to 1.6 feet long in large males and is the longest of any bird. So what is their range? Modern pelicans are found in all continents except Antarctica. The eight living pelican species have a pretty patchy global distribution, ranging latitudinally from the tropics to the temperate zone, although they're absent from the interior of South America and from polar regions and the open ocean. We talked a little bit about how they eat already, but um, oh, let me catch up on the chat here. Oh, nice factos. Are there uh, are there pelicans? I I guess there probably are from what I just said about their range. Although they're kind of patchy, I don't I don't know. Are there pelicans up in uh, Wisconsin? Yeah, in the Atlantic Trace. Yeah, I have a friend who, whenever she sees them, she calls them the dino birds. <laughs> nice fractals. Yeah. <laughs> Fractal's nice. Uh, those are some good pelican jokes. All right, so uh, should I come up here seasonally? Yeah, especially where I'm at. Okay, cool. I didn't know the pelicans came up there. Very neat. So as far as eating, there's a couple of comments in the chat about the ways that pelicans eat. They uh, frequent inland and coastal waters where they feed principally on fish, catching them at or near the water's surface. In deeper water, white pelicans often fish alone. Near the shore, several encircle schools of small fish and form a, form a line to drive them into the shallows, beating their wings on the water surface and then scooping up their prey. So, uh, sailor guy, that's what you were talking about too, is they, they actually coordinate to kind of scare the fish in a certain direction. They also coordinate with other, this is, I don't have this in the notes, but but they coordinate with other birds, it sounds like. So they'll they'll actually work with birds that are not pelicans to, to get bigger hulls of the fish. Uh, it's a pretty smart bird. The other thing is that large fish are caught with the bill tip, so that little hook on the end, and then tossed up in the air to be caught and slid into their gullet head first. So actually just hook it, throw it up, and then eat it right like that. They catch multiple small fish by expanding the throat pouch, which must be drained above the water surface before swallowing. This operation of draining that water takes up to a minute, and during that time other seabirds may try and steal the fish. There's also seabirds that'll come and they'll peck at the pelican's head to try and distract it long enough that they can take the fish from them. It's a pretty uh, birdy bird world out there, I guess. Uh, the brown pelican is unique in that it usually, well, sort of unique in that it usually uh, plunge, it, plunge dives headfirst for its prey from a height as great as 33 to 63 feet. It is one of only two pelicans which do this. So let me pull this up real quick. So again, I'll show this. So there's that attribution on that. And then here's a little video of the pelicans doing a dive. Play it one more time. See that dino bird look? Pretty cool. So they're they're unique in doing that. That's uh not all pelicans do that sort of thing. Oops. It does look painful. Actually, uh, fractals, great lead-in. So pelicans have a, a, a couple of adaptations. One of them is they have this network of air sacs under their skin, situated across the ventral surface, including throat, breast, and undersides of the wings, uh, as well as having air sacs in their actual bones. The air sacs serve to keep the pelican very buoyant, uh, but they also cushion the impact of the pelican's body on the water when they dive from uh, from flight to catch fish. So the air sacs under the skin, besides keeping them buoyant, are also a little bit of extra protection. Kind of cool. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a picture. It's a little gross, but it, what it is is it's a brown pelican and it's opening its mouth and it's inflating its air sac and displaying its tongue. And so you can see some of how the inner bill is structured. Uh, it looks a little bit like it's, I don't know, puking up a lung. So if you don't like that kind of stuff, you can look away, but, um, but you can see a bit about what the air sac looks like under the throat. So, and you can see a little tongue on the end there. Just an itty bitty thing. They also uh, are, have an adaptation where they can dissipate heat excess by rippling the skin uh, of the throat and pouch with the bill open to promote evaporative cooling. 
a fibrous layer deep in the breast muscles can hold the wings rib uh, rigidly horizontal for gliding and soaring, and thus they can use thermals to soar up to heights of 10,000 feet or more. Uh, combine both with gliding and with uh, combine both with gliding and with flap flight in I'm sorry, with flapping flight in V formation, they can go up to distances of about 93 miles to feeding areas if they need to. Pelicans will also fly low or skim. This is a fun fact for the pilots uh, listening along. So pelicans are uh, also low fly over stretches of water, using a phenomenon known as ground effect to reduce drag and increase lift. So that same ground effect is something that pilots deal with, and it means that you can lift the plane off the ground more easily when you're near the ground, um, but you have to be careful about your airspeed because as you leave ground effect, you need more airspeed to keep flying. And so if you lift off before you have enough speed, you leave ground effect, you won't have enough speed to fly and you'll settle back on the runway. This is one of the things that you learn uh, pretty early on in your pilot training because it's, it's a cool. You can feel the ground effect as you get right up next to it. Uh, as far as breeding season goes, so pelicans are gregarious, kind of like sea lions, and nesting colonies. So we talked about them nesting in trees. So here's a picture of them nesting in trees. And here's a picture of them nesting on the ground. So you can see kind of the difference between those two. Pairs of pelicans are magnet... Uh, um, I don't know how to pronounce that word, actually. Uh, have single partners for a single season, but the pair bond only exists, uh, extends only to the nesting area. So mates are independent when away from the nest. So they have a, a strong bond when they're near the nest, but when they go away, then they don't really hang out with each other. The ground nesting uh, species have a complex communal courtship involving a group of males chasing a single female in the air, on land, or in the air while in the water while pointing, gaping, and thrusting their bills at each other. They can finish that process in a day. The tree nesting species have a simpler process in which perched males advertise for females. So a little easier, less uh, less gaping and thrusting of bills. Mention a bit about the relationship to humans, uh, just like sea lions, they have an interesting relationship. So the pelican, the relationship between pelicans and people has often been contentious. Uh, the birds have been persecuted because they're perceived to compete with commercial and recreational fishing. The populations have also fallen, uh, have also fallen through habit, habitat destruction, disturbance, and environmental pollution. And three species are, a, are of conservation concern. So in particular, you might remember like the uh, deep water horizon oil spill, you saw pictures like this. So it's kind of a tragic thing that happens, but this is this is the impact on the pelicans. Pelicans also have a long history in mythology, as well as Christian uh, iconography. So in medieval Europe, the pelican was thought to be particularly attentive to her young, to the point of providing them with blood by wounding her own breast when no other food was available. I, I don't think that's actually true, but that was the perception, was that they would actually hurt themselves to give their own blood to their young if they needed to. The pelican would do that. As a result, the pelican came to symbolize the passion of Christ and the Eucharist, supplementing the image of the lamb and the flag. So if you ever end up in a, uh, a Christian church, you may see something like this, which is a pelican wounding its breast to feed its chicks. Elizabeth I of England adopted this symbol, portraying herself as the mother of the Church of England. And so this is Queen Elizabeth, and I'll zoom in here on her necklace in the center. You can see she's actually wearing a pelican necklace. Uh, to symbolize that sort of thing. So, and you can see there's that, it's wounding itself again to feed its young. Pelican is also the state bird of the U U.S. state of Louisiana, which is known colloquially as the Pelican State, and the bird appears on the state flag and the state seal. I'll close out and summarize uh, pelicans in just a second here, but let me quick, I'm actually gonna pop out of the plane so we can see some of these islands from above. And steadily climbing here, but it's steadily falling, I guess. Santa Cruz Island. So this is uh, Santa Rosa. Let me do this. So we'll, we'll keep flying here, and we should get to the first part of Santa Cruz Island. Um, and you may be able to see a little bit of it in the game, but the interesting part about Santa Cruz Island, one of the interesting parts, is the sea cave. So if you go to the National Park, when you go to the National Park, you can go kayaking there, and you can actually kayak around these sea caves. So there's a couple of uh, a couple of them what they look like, and that's a little bit further along our flight here. It's sort of uh, right around. There's Painted Cave as a waypoint. That's kind of where they are. So, and I think they're in other places too. But that's kind of the famous one. 
also really quick pull up the picture of Catalina Airport and then the Catalina, so this is the Catalina Airport, it's a cute little airport. The approach to Catalina is what's really famous about it. Uh, the runway is curved and so it looks like you're going to fall off the end of the runway, so you need to know that it's curved before you go. And then Catalina Island itself is, is very pretty, so you can go hiking on Catalina Island. Like I said, we won't have time to get to Catalina during the live stream, but after I do my sign off, then I will stay on for a little bit and I'll do a zip over there so anyone who wants to see the airport, see the island approach, uh, can, can stay around for that. All right, so in summary, pelicans are large water birds with a long beak and large throat pouch used for catching prey and draining water from a scooped up contents, uh, used for catching prey, used for catching prey, and they have to drain the water before they eat their food. Although they are large birds, they are light because of air pockets in their skeleton and beneath their skin, enabling them to float high in the water. They are found in all continents except Antarctica and feed principally on fish. They have a long and complicated history in relation to humans, ranging from them being seen as competition for fish to them being seen as a symbol of a mother being attentive to her young. So we'll close out pelicans with a limerick. I'll be doing a variation on a famous limerick uh, by Dixon Merritt from 1910. Uh, also, there's a lie in it about how a pelican uses its throat pouch, so ignore the lie, you'll be able to pick it out. Um, that's also part of why people have misconceptions about pelicans. Uh, but it's a fun little limerick, so we'll, we'll do it anyway. A wonderful bird is the pelican. His bill can hold more than his belly can. He can take in his beak enough food for a week. But I'm darned if I see how the hell I can. <laughs> I didn't mean to go up at the end there. <laughs> Uh, but I'm darned if I see how the hell I can. Anyway. A cute little, cute little one. <laughs> Thanks, fractals. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see, we have about eight minutes left. I would like to do a bit on the person of the week, and I will quickly breeze through this because there's actually a video from the National Park uh, from a Shumesh, uh, native Shumesh person uh, and so she's going to talk a little bit about the mythology, sort of the uh, kind of creation story, not really, but kind of, yeah, uh, creation story is a good, good word for it. So the person this week is actually the Shumash people, as well as uh, Hutash, the Earth Mother. And this is because uh, Hutash is the Earth Mother for the Shumash people in, myth in their mythology. And the Shumash are native people who historically inhabited the central and southern coastal regions of California in portions of what is now San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties. The three northern channel islands were inhabited by an estimated two to 3,000 Shumash, with 11 villages on Santa Cruz, eight on Santa Rosa, and two on San Miguel. As a quick side note while I'm pulling this up, they'll also talk a little bit about where fire came from in this story and Part of the story that isn't mentioned here but was on the National Park page is about uh, the California condor when the Shumash people first were given fire. It saw the fire and it was so interested that it came and flew right up next to it to see what it was. And as the condor flew in, it got too close to the fire and it burned its wings. And so that's why, and the condor originally was a white bird, right? But uh, after burning its wings, it became partially this, this black bird with a little bit of white under its wings. So that's why, is, is because it got too close to the fire when the Shumash first, uh, were first given it, burned its wings, and now there's only a little bit of patch of white left on the condor. All right, so when she mentioned the fire part, you'll, you'll know that a little bit extra background. My name is Julie Tumamayat Stensley. I am an island descendant. My father, Vincent Tumamayat, the son of Cecilio Tumamayat, and the grandson of Juan de Jesus Tumamayat. Our families come from Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island, from villages such as Shwahil, La Oops, Nanuani, and Maschal on Santa Cruz, and from the village of Hechemen on Santa Rosa Island. Sahipaka, once upon a time, here on this beautiful island that we call Limu, meaning in the sea, you know it today as Santa Cruz Island. Mother Earth, Hutash, was out here. And as she had created many things here on the island, she thought something was missing. So she went to a very special plant and she gathered some magic seeds. And she threw the seeds out into the earth here on the island. And pretty soon, up from the ground, up from this beautiful earth, grew these beautiful people. 
She gave them many gifts here and showed them how to live happily on this island. Well, her husband, Atu Oposh, the sky snake, today we know him as the Milky Way. He wanted to give the people a gift too, so he gave them the gift of fire by shooting a bolt of lightning to the ground. Well, the fires burned hot and they kept warm with these fires and they cooked their food. The villages started to grow and grow and be populated with more and more children. Pretty soon, with all the noise from these children, Hutash was annoyed. And she decided that it was time for these people to move on and to move to another place. So she said to herself, I've got to think of some place to put these people, a different place, a place where they could spread out and be very happy. Well, the next morning, she gathered all the people up to a very high, high mountain, Siwot, or as we know it today, Mount Diablo. And as she told the people to look, as they looked up into the sky across the ocean, they saw a beautiful, beautiful rainbow, wished oil. And she told them that that image was a rainbow bridge. And the rainbow bridge was going to take them to a new land that was very large, and they could fill that with people. Well, as people started to climb over the bridge and cross over, many became very dizzy and very frightened because there was a mist and a fog below. They couldn't even see the ocean. Well, as they started falling off, crying out to Hutash for help, she took pity and she changed them and transformed them into dolphins. And that is what we call our brothers and sisters today of the ocean, Alakoi. Those people who crossed over on the bridge went to a place called Tismahu, where it steams out. Today we know that place is Carpinteria, and the people came off that rainbow bridge and spread out into all these beautiful places on our mainland. And that is all. A fun, fun story for it. A little bit of the cultural and, and native background for the area too. All right, thank you Fractals for posting up the link to Survey for Input, uh, Discord for Community, and Twitter for notifications if you just want to know when the next uh, park's going to be going. It's every Tuesday at 7 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock Pacific time, that is. And Fractals, do you mind posting up the poll for next week? So we're going to vote on where we want to go next time. And the three options are Wind Cave National Park, uh, Kubuk Valley uh, National Park, or Regal St. Elise National Park. That's where I'm saying those wrong. While folks are voting on that, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna do a little bit of uh, moving this plane around real quick. So you can do something in the game where you, oops, where you go like that, and then I can drop it. So I wanted to show the this sides of the island here because this is where those sea caves are. It's a pretty cool place to see. And then we're actually going to zip our way real quick over to Catalina Island. While well, people vote on that. So while everyone's voting, today we talked about Channel Islands National Park. We talked a little bit about uh, California sea lions. We talked about pelicans. And we finished off with the Shumash people. Fractals posted up that uh, couple of links. Feel free to check those out. Um, come hang out in the Discord if you want. Uh, post things about national parks, flying, whatever you'd like. Quickly while we're here, this is Santa Barbara Island. So it's a very small island. It's kind of off on its own. Uh, and there's not a lot going on here. I believe it doesn't have enough water to sustain most life. So it's, it's one of those kind of islands. But there's a little bit of uh, some things that grow. And get myself lined up for Catalina here. Okay, I got a couple of votes coming in here. I think that's probably enough to call it. So it sounds like next week we will be going to, if I recall correctly, the largest national park in the country, which is uh, Wrangell St. Elise National Park in Alaska. I might be saying that wrong. Well, I'm excited. Uh, that'll be fun. We'll go and explore that next week. So with that, thank you for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And I'll see you all next week. And like I said, if you would like to see, I will do a landing here at uh, Catalina Island. It should be pretty fun. Uh, and we'll go check out the airport. So if you want to stick around for that, feel free. Otherwise, uh, this will be the sort of official end of the stream for tonight. I'm going to put my headphones on. Uh, I can kind of talk through. Oh, I'm not going to have my headphones on. I can hear myself talking with my headphones on.
Uh, so I will talk through the what I'm thinking and seeing as I go here. Uh, but I'm already doing something you really shouldn't do, which is I'm just doing a straight in landing on this island. Uh, but that's okay. So. Uh, all right, so I know the elevation of the airport is uh, here. Actually, I'll, I'll put on a couple of things that are kind of fun. So I have distance rings and glide rings on here, as well as extended center lines. And so I can actually see when I'm on the center line or not. So I'm not lined up with center line. And then the other thing, this number right here, it says uh, 1600. So that's the elevation of the airport. And then I'm looking on my... Uh, altimeter to see how high above that I am. So I want to be about a thousand above as I start to enter the pattern. Um, and I'm two nautical miles out now, I can see on my distance rings um, and sort of eyeballing it, although it's harder in the sim. So I'm going to start doing now, I should have been doing this before, I'm sort of quickly putting together a landing here, it is slowing the plane down. I'm trying to make sure I'm lined up on center line. And you'll see as we come in here, so part of the reason people like this, I mean, this is, talk about an incredible landing, right? So let me see if I can get myself slowed down. I'm going to put on some flaps. And I'm too high for this, so I'm actually going to do something called a side slip, which is where you pitch the nose to the right and pitch the, or pick, pitch the nose into the wind and then and swing your your ailerons the other direction, so that lets you lose altitude. Okay. I'm watching this. I don't know what the approach speed on this plane is, which is a not a thing I would ever do in a real plane, but uh, it's probably a little bit above stalling speed, which is sort of where I'm at. So. so I can feel that I have a bit of wind coming across the left here, so let's get myself straightened out. Okay, good. I'm going to swing the nose so I line up a center line. Oop. Yeah, a little bouncy, but that's okay. That windsock tells me it's just a bit of wind. All right. Hey, there we go. All right, welcome to beautiful Catalina uh, Island. So this is that um, the scenery that I mentioned that I thought was so impressive. So talk about a fun place to go visit, right? Oops, I think I just ran into that plane. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm parking here. So, a yeah, neat little airport. We'll just park along with the cars. All right. Well, hopefully that was kind of fun. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> yeah, remain, remain seated until you can climb out into your car. Yeah. Hey, nice. Uh, and an extra, was that extra 300? Yeah, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad my landing wasn't the only one that was a little, uh, little bumpy. Cool. All right. Well, it was good to see everyone again. Uh, I will see you next week. So, bye.